Hey guys, Miss Marie Sick here, and in this video, we're going to look at an introduction to bonding and our three different types ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and metallic bonds. So let's start off here with ionic bonds. And in this type, electrons are exchanged between one substance and another. So one of the substances would lose electrons while the other one gains those electrons. And as a reminder, when that happens, we end up forming ions. So in forming that ionic bond, what we want to make sure happens is that the number of electrons that are lost by our cations, our positive ions are equal to the number of electrons gained by our anions, our negative ions. We want to make sure that we don't have electrons floating around aimlessly. They have to have a purpose of where they're going. So whatever is lost by one has to be gained by the other. And so what that means is that sometimes we need multiple ions in order to make sure that those number of electrons cancel out. So here again, ions do get created. And you notice it says that the charges must cancel out. Remember the charges of our ions are tied to how many electrons are lost and gained. And so it makes sense that those would need to cancel out as well. And so again, sometimes we need multiple ions in order to get that to happen. Now, when an ionic bond does form, uh, your ions will orient themselves in a very set pattern. They end up forming what is called a lattice structure. A lattice just means it's a regular repeating pattern of those positive and negative ions. Um, so to kind of get an idea of what this would look like, um, I have here three different pictures of some different ways to represent an ionic compound. And you notice the one in the top corner with the sodium and the chlorine and the Bohr models, uh, what's happened is that the sodium ion has lost its one valence electron that would normally be in its third energy level. And so now we only have two energy levels, but you notice we've put it into brackets there and showing our positive charge. That's to show that it's lost that one electron. And so next to it, we have the chloride ion, also known as chlorine. And so you can see it's got that one blue electron hanging out on that valence shell that's to show the one electron that it's gained from the sodium and so you notice now it has a negative charge outside of that bracket um, so we're going to draw some structures here in a little bit that look very similar to this although we are just going to represent what's called the Lewis dot structure only the valence electrons are shown in that kind of structure here we're showing the whole entire Bohr model but a lot of times we only show what's happening with the valence because the valence electrons are the ones that would be lost and gained. Um, the other two pictures kind of give you an idea of what that lattice pattern looks like. Um, so the one with kind of the green and purple spheres is showing what's called a space filling model. And so again, you can see that repeating positive and negative charge happening there. Um, or on the far right hand side, you see the lattice structure being shown where they actually show lines in between the ions to represent the bonds. So all three of these images are representing sodium chloride, NaCl, where sodium loses one electron and chlorine gains one electron. So the positive one and negative one charges cancel out. We're just seeing three different ways of representing that same exact thing. All right, uh, now if we wanted to make a quick identification of an ionic bond from just what the formula looks like, uh, there's going to be some set things that we're going to look for in that equation, in that formula. Um, and that would be we could either find a metal and a non-metal together. For example, we just saw sodium chloride, sodium being a metal and the chlorine becoming the chloride ion ends up being a non-metal. Um, but you could also have in these compounds our polyatomic ions that we've been learning, nitrate, chlorate, sulfate, all of those poly ions where you have multiple elements together that have a charge, and so all together they would be an ion. So you could also see here a metal plus one of those negatively charged polyatomic ions, or we have one polyatomic ion that does have a positive charge. It's known as ammonium, and it has a formula of NH4 with a positive one charge. So you could have the ammonium with a non-metal, or you could have the ammonium with a polyatomic ion. Now, once we write those two substances together, uh, we would make sure that they balance each other out with charge, and so we no longer show the charge in the overall compound. So you will be able to kind of pick up the pieces in your compound, but you won't see those charges present anymore. Uh, they're understood to have been balanced out. 
And the other way we can identify an ionic bond is by using the difference in electronegativity. As a reminder, electronegativity is all about the pull to gain an electron. So we want to pair up something where one of our substances has a really big pull to gain an electron, and the other one is not so much pulling, so it would have a very low electronegativity. And what that would end up doing is creating a really big difference in electronegativity, so much so where one of the elements could completely pull the electron away from the other one. Now, when we write difference in electronegativity, a lot of times you'll see it abbreviated with the delta symbol, that triangle that you see, and then EN to represent electronegativity. So if you ever see that used as an abbreviation, don't get freaked out by it. It just means difference in electronegativity. Um, so here again, we're looking for a really big difference. Um, most textbooks will say it's about 1.7 or greater. Um, and the reason why I mention that is because the quick identification that you see up above with the element types works, I would say, probably about 98% of the time. 98% of the time, you could use that quick identification to figure out something being ionic. But there's a chance, a 2% chance, that a compound may be ionic and not necessarily fit that particular setup. Or it might have that setup and actually not be ionic. It might actually be covalent. So there are a couple times where we see some exceptions. But in general, if I'm identifying something as being ionic or covalent, I'm going to use that quick identification to do so, unless for some odd reason they give us those differences in electronegativity. They give us electronegativity values to go ahead and calculate that. Um, most of the time, the quick identification is good enough. All right, to kind of give us an idea of the whole difference difference in electronegativity. I have a little picture on the next slide, um, and it just shows that what we are wanting to happen here is that one of our atoms has a strong enough pull to gain any electrons away from the one that has a weaker pull. And so if that difference is strong enough, then our electrons will completely be transferred from one element to another. If that difference was not great enough, what that means is that those electrons would still be sharing, and that's where we have our next type of bond of covalent bonds. Um, so here, electrons are shared to satisfy what is called the octet rule. Uh, the octet rule, if you look at that prefix of oct, indicating eight, uh, this would be that elements are wanting to get to ideally eight valence electrons. That would indicate that the valence S and P sublevels are totally full. And that creates a sense of stability in that element where it ends up being kind of like a noble gas. Remember, noble gases, group 18, are also called the inert gases. They don't react, and the reason why is they have those valence S and P. They're fairly stable. Stable. And so everything else is trying to kind of look like that. That's the whole goal. Um, now, when that sharing occurs, it can either do so evenly or unevenly. If the sharing is even, that means one of our elements is not really pulling any more strongly than the other. They're kind of pulling equally. And so we would say that it's nonpolar, that there's not different poles or different sides to the molecule, that they're basically pulling on those electrons the same. Now, if the pulling is uneven, where one is pulling quite a bit more than the other one, but not necessarily enough to rip it off and become ionic, then we would say it would be a polar covalent bond. So our covalent bonds are kind of subcategorized into being either nonpolar or polar, depending on how different the polling is. Now here with covalent bonds, we would say that a molecule gets created. So instead of that lattice structure with the repeating positive and negatives, here we're going to have discrete molecules that we'll be able to draw. Now here, if I want to do a quick identification, I would be looking for only nonmetals in my compound. Now here I've just wrote nonmetals plus nonmetal. Um, so you could have, you know, just two elements, um, but you could also have more than that. If you think back to biology, you had some really big molecules that had only nonmetals in them, and they were considered covalent. Things like, you know, glucose or DNA structures or carbohydrates, all those things you can think of that you drew back in biology would have been considered covalent. Um, however, if I wanted to double check something as being covalent, obviously I could double check the electron electronegativity difference. And with this, you notice that if the difference is below 0 0.3, we typically consider to be 
nonpolar. What that means is the sharing is pretty much even, and so one side's not really pulling more than the other. Um, if the difference is 0.3 up to about 1.7, we would consider it to be a polar bond. Now one is pulling significantly more than the other, but not enough to completely rip it away and be considered ionic. So keep in mind that some textbooks will kind of differ on where they put these uh, particular values. Um, it is kind of a continuous spectrum, so depending on where you're at in the spectrum would depend on where you're classifying this, but there can be some overlap there. Um, I know substances uh, for a fact that have an electronegativity difference that's a little bit above 1.7 that do have more covalent qualities to them than ionic. So there can be some overlap there. Just kind of keep that in mind that these are just kind of some ballpark numbers to give us a way to identify. Now, to give us a picture representation of what's happening here, again, with a nonpolar covalent bond like we see on the left, uh, your elements are going to be shared evenly. And a lot of times we see this with substances that are diatomic, where you have the same element bonded to itself. Obviously, if you have hydrogen bonded to hydrogen, uh, the difference in electronegativity would be zero because they both have the same value. Um, and so those electrons would be shared very evenly between them. Um, however, However, on the right hand side, you notice our polar covalent, um, the chlorine is pulling much more than the hydrogen would. Again, chlorine is closer to fluorine, so it more than likely has a higher electronegativity value. And so that's why it's kind of almost partially winning the tug of war, but not completely. It's not strong enough to rip it away from the hydrogen. Hydrogen's kind of, you know, clinging on for dear life there. So that's why we haven't crossed over yet to being completely ionic there. All right, so now, metallic bonds is our third type and what's interesting about metallic bonds is that we actually see these when we also have pure elements which is very unusual we don't normally think about pure elements as having a bond uh, what happens with a metallic bond is that an electron c is created when metals try to donate their valence electrons remember metals love to lose their electrons they love to give them off to something else and so sometimes it tries to give those away even if there's really nothing there to take them and so we end up with this kind of surrounding electrons around our metals and those valence electrons are free to move around and that ends up giving metals some very distinct properties that we don't see with other types of substances. Um, for example, it causes metals to be malleable and ductile. Malleable means that you can flatten it into a sheet like you can hammer it down and get it really flat. Uh, ductile means that you can draw or bend it into a wire. So both of those are about the movability of that substance. Rather than it being you know, very brittle, it instead is very flexible. Um, and that's because of that sea of electrons allows some movement that we don't see in other substances. Also, we see luster here. Luster is how shiny our metal is. And that comes from the way that the light interacts with that sea of electrons. Um, um, we also are conductive of electricity in any state. Um, covalents don't conduct electricity at all. Um, ionics only conduct electricity if you break the lattice structure. So like, for example, if you dissolve an ionic, it would conduct. But metallics will conduct electricity in any state, whether it's a solid or a liquid. Uh, we don't see a gas because the elements are too far apart. And plus, good luck trying to get a metal to turn into a gas. You'd have to heat it up insanely hot, and that just doesn't happen. Um, but it's one of the only things that conducts electricity as a solid. And that really helps us when we're thinking about, say, wires in our house and trying to conduct electricity. Obviously, those would all be made out of metals. Um, these are present in both pure element metals. So like, for example, if I just had a sample of silver, I a sample of silver would have metallic bonding, um, but we also see it in mixtures of metals. And as a reminder, alloys are our mixtures of metals, our homogeneous solutions. So things like bronze and brass and steel, substances that are not on the periodic table, but we know are a combination of those metals. Now, the good news for us with metallic bonding is that you're really not going to be asked to identify this type from a compound formula because, as we can see, it's either a pure element or a solution, and so we don't really have compounds that have metallic bonding.
Um, here is a picture of what that sea of electrons kind of looks like. You notice those electrons are kind of free floating in between all of those silvers there. Um, and again, that gives those metallic bonding all those properties that we talked about just a moment ago. All right, so here's what we're going to do now. I want us to take a moment to see if we have a list of compounds, if we can identify them as being ionic or covalent. Again, we're not going to ask you to do this for metallic, so you're not going to have to worry about that. But what you're going to be looking for here is just using our quick identifications. So the substance types, you're not going to have to uh, calculate electronegativity difference here. What you want to see if you can do is identify these as being Ionic, where we have either a metal or non-metal together, or maybe a polyatomic ion with something. Um, or do we have a covalent where it's just non-metals? Um, as a reminder, when you're looking at your periodic table, don't forget that on your periodic table, you have that zigzag line that separates your metals and your non-metals. So on the right-hand side, you're going to have all of your non-metals. Whereas on the left-hand side, you're going to have all of your uh, metals, with the exception of hydrogen. So you might need to look at a periodic table as you're doing this, just as a reminder. Um, so if you want to go ahead and pause the video, if you want to pull out a periodic table, take just a moment and see if you can identify these substances as being ionic or covalent. So go ahead, pause the video, and try that out. Okay, did you pause it? Did you try it out? Let's see how we did. So our first three here, MgCl2, we have magnesium and chlorine together. Magnesium's a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, and so that would more than likely be ionic. Uh, the next one, we have carbon and hydrogen, and both of those are non-metals, and so that one would have been covalent. Now, the next one's kind of interesting because we see three elements present there, and my advice to you is if you ever see three elements present, always watch out to see if maybe there's a polyatomic ion that's present in there. If you notice here, we see ClO3, which if you think back to your polyatomic ion list, ClO3 with a negative one charge would be chlorate. So here I have potassium, a metal, with the polyatomic ion of chlorate. Again, it's not shown with its charge because the charges are balancing out, but that charge would have been there. And so this would have been a metal plus a polyatomic ion, so it would have been ionic. All right, so now let's go ahead and look at our last three. Um, so SO3 is kind of a tricky one. I have a lot of people, when they look at SO3, they're like, oh, that kind of looks like sulfite, you know, SO3 negative two. And I'm like, yeah, it kind of does, but is it shown with something that could be balancing out the charge? And it's not. It's not shown with a metal or with ammonium. And it's also not shown with its charge. And so therefore, this is not sulfite here. This is actually just a non-metal and a non-metal together, and it would have been covalent. Um, it's actually a compound called sulfur trioxide. So be really careful. Uh, if you think you have a polyatomic ion, always look to see that it's with something else that's balancing out that charge if it's not shown. So you can't just assume it's a polyatomic ion if that other substance isn't there. All right, on the next one, uh, we see again three elements. So there's a really good chance there's a polyatomic ion somewhere in there. And I recognize the NH4 positive one, the uh, ammonium polyatomic ion. And that polyatomic ion is with bromine, which is a non-metal. And so this would have been an ionic compound. Uh, last but not least down here, uh, we see three elements. So my first instinct would be to look to see if maybe I have a polyatomic ion but I don't have one in there that I recognize. Um, and so therefore, this would just be all non-metals together, and this would have been covalent. And I bet a lot of you recognize this compound as being glucose, C6H12O6, that you studied back in biology. All right, I hope we're feeling good about the differences between ionic, covalent, and metallic bonding, as well as being able to identify an ionic from a covalent bond when you're dealing with a formula for your compound. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.